Hi, welcome to Give Cheese a Chance, where I encourage you to make cheese at home. I'm Marianne. I love to travel to France, and when I do, I make sure to always visit their fromageries so I can taste some of the best cheeses in the world. And one of my favorite French cheeses is called Crotin de Chavignol. It's a goat's milk cheese that has a wrinkly fungal coat. Crotin is sold in small discs and has different characteristics depending on their age and can even get areas of edible blue mold growing on them. Crotin de Chavignol is protected with a PDO label, so it has a strict manufacturing process, just like Champagne does, so it cannot be legally called Crotin de Chavignol if it is made outside of a strict region in France. True Crotin also uses raw milk, so since Crotin is PDO protected, I can't make it at home and officially call it Crotin de Chavignol, but we can make a goat cheese at home using a fungal coat and store-bought pasteurized and homogenized milk and enjoy it just the same. Today I'd like to give you a demonstration of how to make a goat cheese which is similar to, but not exactly the same as Crotin de Chavignol, but it is really good. If you like goat cheese, you're going to like this because the flavor is even stronger than a regular goat cheese you can get in the store. You can eat this cheese as early as 10 days, although I like it best at two to three weeks old. You can even age it longer if you like a more pronounced flavor. These are samples of what we're going to make. There's two slightly different versions of the same cheese. This one has a whiter fungal coat because it uses both penicillin candidum and geotrichum fungal cultures. This one does not use penicillin candidum. It uses geotrichum candidum by itself. Some people like the whiter coat. So if you like a whiter coat on this cheese, feel free to use both fungal cultures. And I'll show you how in the recipe. But if you like a drier coat with a very brainy texture, a tighter brainy texture on your cheese, then use just geotrichum. Here are the tools that we'll need for our project today. A large pot, a casserole dish, and a rack, like a roasting rack that you can place on top to catch the drippings. You'll need some molds for our cheese. These are specifically designed for crotin, but these are great crotin molds. We'll need four of them. If you don't have crotin molds, you might have to look around your kitchen and be a little creative. For example, when I made a camembert once, I used a cookie tin like this. This is it exactly. And I punched holes in the bottom. So you might have to look around your kitchen if you don't have access to crotin molds. You're also going to need a colander and a piece of fabric. Now butter muslin is the fabric of choice for cheese making projects, but if you don't have butter muslin, you can use a pillowcase that you dedicate to your cheese making projects. And I'll show you how I use this pillowcase in our project today. You're also going to need a large ladle, a spoon, and some very small measuring spoons. These go as small as 1 64th of a teaspoon. And if you don't already have a set of small measuring spoons like this, I suggest you purchase some because they come in very handy when you're making cheeses. You'll also need a thermometer to take the temperature of your milk. You're going to be needing a blanket and you'll see why. And you're gonna need a ripening box. Now, if you haven't already seen my video on affinage, then I suggest you go there. A ripening box is a plastic bucket that should have a tray to keep the cheeses off the bottom of the bucket, as well as another layer on top. You can either use a bamboo sushi mat or a piece of plastic matting. And the last thing I wanna to talk to you about are pH strips, which are totally optional for this project. Sometimes when cheese making projects don't work, it's often because the pH is off. So I'm gonna show you how we can use pH to make sure that our cheese is progressing correctly in this video. And here are the ingredients we'll be using for this project. First, you'll need one gallon or four liters of goat's milk. This is a whole goat's milk 
which has been pasteurized. I got it from my local grocery store. You're going to need some salt. You can either use kosher salt or a specialty cheese salt. You're going to need a source of non-chlorinated water. So if you don't have non-chlorinated water, just put some water from the tap into a bowl the night before and by morning, all the chlorine will have dissipated and you'll have non-chlorinated water ready to go. You're going to need some liquid rennet. I'm using double strength rennet, so always follow the instructions on your rennet to see how much you should use for the recipe. I'm also using calcium chloride. This is a 33% strength solution. And we're going to be using three direct set cultures for this project. The first one is Flora Danica. If you don't have Flora Danica, you can use MM100 or Aroma B. And the other two cultures are fungal cultures. And remember what I said at the beginning of this video that you'll have a choice to use either one or both of these in a recipe. You'll either be using Geotrichum candidum by itself or Geotrichum candidum with penicillin candidum as well. So let's get started. Add one gallon or four liters of goat's milk to a heavy bottomed pot, which will hold the heat better. You want to heat this on low to 75 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit or 24 to 25 degrees Celsius. You want to stir it occasionally, and it should take about 10 to 15 minutes to reach the target temperature. While your milk is heating up, use your small measuring spoons to measure out one eighth of a teaspoon of Flora Danica bacterial culture, which will acidify the milk over its incubation time. Then measure one sixteenth of a teaspoon of Penicillium candidum. And measure one sixty fourth of a teaspoon of Geotrichium candidum. When the target temperature has been reached, sprinkle your cultures onto the surface of your milk and let them sit there for three to five minutes before stirring them in. And when the three to five minutes are over, stir the milk for one whole minute using a metal spoon making sure you get the milk at the bottom of the pot to mix with the milk at the top as well. Dilute one quarter teaspoon of liquid calcium chloride into one quarter cup of non-chlorinated water and give it a stir. Now add your calcium chloride solution to the milk and stir. And after you've stirred it very well, wait 25 to 30 minutes before adding your rennet. Use 1 8 of a teaspoon of double strength rennet and put it into a quarter cup of non-chlorinated water and stir. After the time is up, add your rennet solution and stir thoroughly for one minute. Now cover the pot and wrap the whole thing in a blanket to keep the heat in. Now let this incubate for 24 hours. I like to keep my incubating milk out of the way, so I store it in an oven, which seems to hold the temperature better. Just make sure if you're going to do that, to put a sign on the oven so no one accidentally turns it on. It's been 24 hours, so let's take a look inside the pot. You should see a curd mass with a lot of clear whey on the top. Don't be afraid if you see the curd mass has pulled away from the sides of the pot or if there are cracks in the curd mass. That's a sign of a strong curd. Now use your ladle to remove all the clear whey that's at the top. Now 
The next step is totally optional. It's a bit sciency, but if you happen to have pH strips, which I do, take some of the clear whey, there's always some left in the pan, and pour it onto a pH strip. Sometimes when a cheese doesn't work, it usually means that the pH is off. So in this case, you want the pH to be between 4.4 and 4.6. So let's see what we have. This looks like 4.5, which is perfect. If you find the pH is greater than 4.6, just put the lid back on, wrap it up, and let it incubate a little bit longer. Try again in another hour or so. Now, before we fill our crotin molds, we want to pre-drain it. I have already sterilized an old pillowcase which I use for my cheese making projects. I've boiled it in water for 15 minutes and I let it cool and I've placed it over a colander. So put this into a sink and use your ladle to pick up the curd and fill the bag. That is a nice curd, nice and thick. It has set very well. Once all the curd has been added to your strainer, let it drain for two to four hours. It's even better to hang the curd from your sink faucet, if you have one like this, to allow for the best drainage. While you're waiting for the curds to drip, sterilize four crotan molds and a ladle by boiling them for 15 minutes and then letting them cool. So these curds have been draining now for about four hours and it's time to transfer the contents into micro tan molds. Make sure you divide your curds equally amongst the four molds and then let them sit for another four hours. We're gonna come back and flip them. And when the time is up, grab a bamboo sushi mat or a piece of plastic netting like this and flip your cheeses over so that they can drain overnight. It's now the next morning and we're gonna flip each one of our cheeses. Then it's time to add salt to the surface of each cheese. I'm using kosher salt, but you can use a fine sea salt or a cheese salt. Measure one eighth of a teaspoon to one quarter of a teaspoon of salt and add it to the surface of each cheese. The purpose of the salt is to do several things. It adds flavor, it draws excess moisture out of the cheese and it preserves the cheese longer. Then let that drain for another four hours. In the meantime, set up a ripening box. This is basically a plastic Rubbermaid bucket. And in the bottom, you have a tray that will keep your cheeses off the bottom of the bucket. And on top of that, put a bamboo sushi mat. Now when the time has come, I want you to turn each cheese directly over into the bucket. The cheeses will fall to the bottom and we're going to unmold them. And whatever amount of salt you added before, whether it was one eighth of a teaspoon or a quarter of a teaspoon, if you want your cheese slightly saltier, add that same amount of salt onto the surface and sides of these cheeses. Then take the lid of your bucket and place it on top slightly ajar. We want a little bit of airflow. It's very important to wipe out any moisture that has accumulated at the bottom of this bucket over the next two days. Then take this and put it in a cool area of your house, anywhere from 10 degrees Celsius to 15 degrees Celsius. My cold room in the basement is right now at about 13, so that's a perfect temperature.
you're going to have to make sure you turn these cheeses every day for the next 14 days. Here is the version of this goat cheese with both Geotrichum candidum and Penicillin candidum as it ages. And here is the final product ready to serve. Here is the version of the Geotrichum candidum only cheese as it progresses. And here is the final product, ready to serve. After these cheeses are totally covered in mold, you can put them in a smaller container and keep them in your regular refrigerator at four degrees Celsius. <sighs> it's been three weeks now since I made these cheeses and I am going to enjoy the fruits of my labor. This is the version of the cheese with both the fungal cultures, the penicillin candidum and the geotrichum together. And this is the version of the cheese just with the geotrichum. So I'm going to do a little bit of a taste test. Mm. That is very good. Very creamy. The right amount of salt. The honey works perfect with this goat cheese. Great cheese. Mmm, that cheese is great. It's just a little bit drier. I really like it. I think I might prefer this one. It's just a bit creamier and I think that that is some of the action of the penicillin candidium. But both of these are great cheeses. I would recommend them to anyone who likes goat cheese. Now, if you're expecting this to be like a goat cheese you can buy at the grocery store like a chev, it's not the same. This has a much stronger goat flavor than a regular chev. And if you're wondering about the rind, the rind is totally edible. Just like when you're eating a camembert, you eat the rind as well, and it's part of the experience and it lends a lot of flavor. Well, that was a tasty treat. I really hope you've enjoyed this video about a goat cheese that is inspired by the Crotin de Chavignol that I had in Paris. Please like this video, subscribe to this channel, and leave a comment below. I'd really appreciate hearing from you. Until the next time you join me on Give Cheese a Chance, I'm Marianne. Take care.